Brother Matt with us. Amen. He's going to preach tonight. Amen. Get him to come. Come, we can come on, Brother Matt. Good to us. Appreciate his goodness to me. It's great to see you folks again. And um, we love you. You can be seated for I love you stand to read the word. How do you do it here? We'll do it here. Y'all do that. We'll do it in just a minute. And it's only one verse. Y'all are going to treat it. Um, praise God. Well, I'm just uh, full, and uh, the Lord's been just so kind to me and family. Uh, it's been several months since I've been really out, and uh, matter of fact, it's been a good while. And we had some, I guess 2019 was probably the kind of a tough year for me physically. Um, I've always had good health, you know, and this one hit me pretty good. I had, had surgery on uh, a tumor, and I'm thankful the Lord uh, saw fit to make it the non-cancerous kind. <laughs> so it was up in my neck area and uh, I was kind of walking like that old Fred Sanford guy there on Sanford and Sons. <laughs> that's a little before your time, some of the young folks, but that's just an old man walks like that. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, it was bu bugging me. I'd go to campus and drag myself on, drag myself off. <laughs> But uh, the Lord sustained me, and we would preach for a good while with uh, with with the Holy Ghost helping me. But that was the first semester, but then December rolled around, I had to have something done. Pray for God to heal me, and just on and on. And um, I took a fall in July, fixing my RV and broke my wrist. I thought that's what caused it, but. It really was a blessing because I had to have an MRI done. And if that's when they found up, up here what was causing all that. So, you know, it's amazing how something about, like, you know, that big, about the size of that ball cap, can mess your whole life up, you know. Just mess your body up. The knee bone is connected to the elbow bone. I'm clear. Yeah. <laughs> so, I thank God that he brought me through the surgery. They got it all out. The first day I was able to get out of the bed in the hospital, I was able to walk straight. Yeah. Not sideways and hopped up, so praise God. Amen. But, amen, I thank God for I can get around and work it. Some, and getting out preaching some, uh, but not like I'd like to, but sometimes it's just got to slow down. So. The Lord has been very good to me, so I'm thankful. But uh, we greet you from Missouri again, and uh, my wife, Sonia, and the children. We thank you for praying for us and for helping us to go. You know, you, you all have helped us in times that have gone by. We appreciate that. We sure do. Not many full-time campus preachers left out there. Some of them that are out there, you know. Amen. I like to be in there. Amen. Out there. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Um, so I'm thankful. You know, I, I tell you, the devil, he'll try to work on your mind, won't he? Yes, he'll do it. He'll try to do it. I remember the story of a young boy was up in his room. There he was, and the dad was downstairs with the family setting, you know, 
He kept hearing the voice say, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Once while, he said, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. Finally, my dad went up there wondering, what are, what's he talking about, man? What, what's going on, son? What's up with this? You're going to get it, I think. He said, been, well, dad, I was reading this old Western book here, and, and uh, you know, I kept reading where the bad guys were getting going up on the good guys, you know. So finally, I just went to the end of the book and read the, the outcome of it, and the good guys won. And the sheriff and the marshal and, you know, all that good stuff. And and, 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 and every time I would, and I went back to read the book, and every time I come to the place where the bad guys were getting up, I said, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And, you know, the devil's going to get it. That's right. He's going to yes, get it. Yes, he is. Yes. He ain't got time or all the time in the world. This time is short, the Bible says in Revelation 12. So let's remember that and be not discouraged or dismayed at trials and difficulties you go through. So we appreciate the Lord. Thank you for your giving, hospitality once again. We're going to get into the Word of God here again. I, I've been... Uh, said then the Illinois. We're going to Psalm 34, verse, verse number uh, 17. I told you one verse. I, I added a couple. It's only three now. So sorry about that. But thank you very much. Appreciate you, Pastor. Appreciate your burden for the lost. And um, thank you uh, for the hospitality and, and just everything. We appreciate you all. These campuses get crazier and crazier and everything going on in our world, but we're preaching from a book that gives us total victory. Amen. Amen. And that's what we're talking about here tonight, total victory. Amen. It'll make sense, and I'll try not to keep you long at all. Verse 17 of chapter 34. The Bible says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. That calls a whole lot of people out, doesn't it? Amen. It goes from many to few. So many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Amen. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, I had surgery it wasn't long ago in December, and uh, you know, I just thought of a story where an orderly had asked the patient if it was his first surgery, and uh, he said, "Yeah, I'm nervous. This is my first surgery." And then he asked the surgeon. If he was nervous, he said, yeah, this is my first surgery. <laughs> you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Not just numerically. It also means many things that cause them. There's a variety of things. Well, this ain't our first surgery, is it? This ain't the first time. There's going to be more. And, you know, they can even be self-inflicted for um, such was the case, excuse me, of, <coughs> of David as he wrote this psalm here in Psalm 34. In fact, this psalm was written after his terrible blunder uh, with, uh, you know, he went down to Gath. You remember the story when he went down to Gath and he was asking uh, King Achish for asylum there. And David realized after he got there, he made a real bad mistake. Have you ever been there? You know, he's he just started, uh, you know, he let David go, if you remember that, because David just started acting like a slobbering nut. And, you know, he saw that, and his feigning that caused that. But he realized he, made, he wrote this psalm right after that had happened, as I understand it. Now, going down there in the first place for David wasn't very wise. That wasn't an act David was really doing there. He was, uh, 
he killed Goliath from Gath, and you know, their top man is dead, and then he goes into Gath seeking asylum before he started all the slaughtering and stuff. And it was it just was a bad move. But you know, the the point is even good folks do dumb things. Amen. That's right. Oh, you ever been there? I mean, sometimes we don't act with wisdom, do we? It gets us in trouble. But you'll notice David finishing the verse, the Lord delivereth them out of them all. And David realized, amen, inspired by the Holy Ghost, you know, I've messed this up. I've really messed things up. And, you know, he's not saying it's a license to do any of these things. But if we do, we've got to cooperate with God on how he chooses to deliver us. Amen. Let me say that again. We've got to cooperate with God on how he chooses to deliver us. Right. Amen. Out of something. And um, we've got to go his way. That's the way, you know, with the postman. He delivers the mail and it's the same way with the Lord. You know, he delivers it. You might jerk the letter out of the postman's hand, but once it goes in the slot, it's on the way to its destination. Amen. It's the same way, you know, in, in, in that respect. <clears throat> Once you leave it there, your problem, your difficulty, your whatever it may be, then you've got to leave it there. You've got to leave it right there. Hezekiah, amen, tonight as we go through a couple of examples, he had a hopeless situation, amen. He was afflicted, and you know the story of Hezekiah. He got a, a disease in his body there, and... The Bible says that God told him to set his house in order for you're going to die. And he's got his back against the wall there. And that saying there implies, you know, I've got to fight my way out of this. When your back is against the wall, that's what it means is I've got to fight my way out of this thing. And, you know, we cried unto the Lord. The Bible says that Hezekiah's face was to the wall. Amen. He wasn't about to fight his way out of something like this. And that's a problem with a lot of people when they try to fight their way out of difficulties and trials and afflictions and something comes your way, amen, that God says, no, you just need to face the wall, face your problem, face the situation, amen. And this is what Hezekiah did. He put his face against the wall, amen, and the way out of this one was only a prayer, a miracle, amen, about, you know, uh, uh, I can't remember how many, uh, about a little over a hundred words in the prayer, if you read it, I believe I have that right, amen, if you read the prayer, and only a prayer there is going to get him out of the situation. In Psalms 107, the Bible says in verse 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunk man. They are at their wit's end. But then they cry unto the Lord in their distress, and the Lord delivered him out of those distresses. In fact, four times in Psalm 107, the Bible says, when you're staggering like a drunk man, when you're, you've come to the end of your wisdom and knowledge and understanding, amen, over a situation, amen, that you, amen, are in that place, amen, of at your wit's end. That's not honesty. This is reality, amen, where we come to the end of our knowledge. All wisdom is swallowed up, in fact, that means. And Hezekiah, amen, was like that in that occasion, on that occasion, like some of us. This thing is too big for me. It's too much for me. You say, Brother Matt, you know, we live in a time where there's every kind of problem you can think of out there. We're faced with... Uh, Conditions in the globe from wars and pestilence and every kind of virus you can think of, amen, spreading over into our United States of America, everything we're going to be faced with, and we're going to have to have something in us more than just a little church going. There's going to be, have to be something more than just a little prayer. We're going to have to have Christ in us really to face what we're going to face. And Hezekiah was in this situation. He's in this circle. And he cried unto the Lord. Amen. And you know the story. Isaiah turned back around. Amen. And went to Hezekiah. And, and told him. You're not going to die. You're going to live. Because God has heard your cry. Before he got out of the courtyard. 
Amen. He heard. Jeremiah was another prophet. Amen. Or he was a prophet. Down in the pit. Amen. In 38 and 6 of Jeremiah. It says they cast him into the dungeon. In the court of the prison. And they let him down by the cords. You know they put him under his armpits like that. And they just lowered him down. And to the bottom of that mire, and to the bottom, you know, the dungeon down there is, you know, the dungeon's on the bottom, and the prison is several stories high. And, um, you know, the mire at the bottom of that dungeon is sort of like everything just flows downhill. It just goes down, down, down. Amen. Not water, but mire and sludge where they put... The man of God. Amen. Every eight foot, there's a floor there with prisoners and there's excrement. Amen. Coming down. And that's essentially what he was up to his waist in. Human waste. And so, what's the battle? What's the battle? We hear the same lie from the devil in hell. You know, good Christians, why... We'll never have any problems. And I, you know, know that having problems doesn't mean you're a saint. Amen. But the Bible says many are the afflictions Amen. of the righteous. Amen. Of the righteous. Yes, Amen. Sir. There is no peace to the wicked. They've got problem after problem here tonight. They're doping up, meth them crack. You drunken, doping, whatever they're doing, amen, abusing one another, amen, on and on, amen, and people wonder, listen, folks, I, I, I know it doesn't mean, I mean, Herod had parasites and he died. Stephen was stoned, amen, one of them was a scoundrel, and one of them was a man of God, amen. It rains on the just and the unjust, and that time and chance happen to everybody. And being a Christian is not going to vaccinate you, amen, from bad trouble. Bad trouble came, amen, to Hezekiah. It came to Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He's thundering judgment. God's man is afflicted. We see bizarre illustrations there that Jeremiah gave to show Israel their idolatry, their whoredoms, and their rebellion in the prison. I mean, you can look there. Amen. The, the, the second longest book in the Bible. Jeremiah. And he tells us many of the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivers us from them all. In Acts 16 and 24, the Bible says, Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast, stalks, and at midnight... Uh, it was what they held him. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, singing praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Amen. You know, um, in the aging process, your, 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 your eyes don't hurt. They just don't work like they used to. Um, you know, my ears don't hurt, but they just don't work like they used to. My Hair, what little I've got here does not hurt. It's just like, you know, I look like a mangy dog or something like that, you know, if I don't keep, keep it cold, amen. Paul and Silas were hurting in Philippi. They're in a prison in Macedonia, amen, from the Macedonian call and the vision in Acts chapter 16, and it was simply a response to the come help. And look what happened in their response to a, uh, you know, come and help us. We need help. And what happened was they run hard nose into trouble. You can run into trouble obeying the call of God. Did you know that? I think that's pretty clear. Amen. 2 Corinthians 7 and 5. And when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. They were doing the will of God. From within, there's fear. From without, there's fighting. There's corruption. There's, there's violence. There's all kinds of things from without that can cause you to fear from within. Paul, I want you to go to Corinth, a wicked city. But the Bible says, fear not. Paul said, don't fear, for I have many people in that city. Now, I wouldn't have told them there was nothing to, you know, if there was nothing to fear, if there was something, to, if he wasn't afraid. 
Paul's afraid of something. He said, fear not. For I have many people in that city. Here, the Christian life can be painful, as we see with Paul and Silas here. Amen? Inescapable. It's not humanly possible. Paul and Silas are in a situation, amen, they could do nothing about. You can't do anything about the condition or the circumstance that you're in sometimes. There's nothing you can do when they put you out for surgery. You know, you're gone. The next thing you remember, five hours later, you wake up in recovery. You don't remember anything unless the Lord just, you know, sends you something. I didn't receive anything when I was out for those five hours or so of surgery to remove this. You know, the call of God, he's not responsible to give you weather updates. God's not responsible to give you an update every day. Or every second. He's not obligated to, to give you prognostication, you know, of what what's going to happen in your life today. He, he, he doesn't have to do that. What we need to do is just trust God. I've gotten in more trouble, amen, doing or at least trying to do the will and the work of God ever since I received a call to preach right down here in Beaumont, Texas over 20 years ago at the School of Christ to preach on the campuses. I've gotten more trouble, I've gotten more difficulty, more, you know, I've caused more stress for my wife, I guess, than, than, and, 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 than I did prior to her. The call. What's happening here to Paul and Silas? You know, I, I don't understand some folks, but, you know, they say uh, that if you have trouble, you got sin in your life. Or if you got having afflictions and you're poor and you can't pay your bills and you're sick or afflicted in some way. Listen, folks, you just can't walk away. They couldn't get up and walk away out of that prison house, amen? They couldn't ignore it either. They couldn't even assess the damage when the earthquake hit. They couldn't understand that. It was dark everywhere, amen? Have you been there where you can't assess? You're just in a place, well... Maybe this is one of those messages that you need to put in your savings account because there may be something coming. You're either going into a storm in the middle of one or coming out of one. Amen. That's usually how it is. Amen. There's dark everywhere. You ain't got to be in a jailhouse to get in a fix. Amen. You ain't got to be in a jailhouse to be in a fix. Amen. Wits end. The devil will work you over if you let him. If you allow the devil to work you over, I mean, that's a difficult thing, amen? Paul and Silas were sitting there, excrement everywhere, rats everywhere, filth everywhere, vermin everywhere, disease everywhere, darkness everywhere. They're in stocks. It's not very comfortable. The food was horrible, I'm sure. They're not getting treated very well. They didn't have what we have today. They, they, they laugh at this. They take joy, maybe. I don't know. This, this is so right, you know. I could preach unencumbered in here. No. That's how it was. The yeah. Apostle Paul and Silas, they were they were they were in, in the middle of it. And you know that you know what happened there. The prisoners, they heard. You see, that's why we're out there. You get in in a, in a, in a tight place or in a in a trial. These people that are enslaved to sin need to hear. They need to hear. Amen. They're prisoners and slaves to sin. And they need to hear the truth. And if we don't tell them, they'll never get out of the prison house. Amen. Another story we talk about Peter. He claimed, <clears throat> or rather chained to two guards there. And, you know, that might be a bit of overkill, but at Acts chapter 6, when Herod would have brought him for, that is Peter, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers were bound with chains, or two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. You ever felt like the devil, you know, is giving you a little bit more attention than, uh, than you need? You, you pay attention. I mean, you're, if you're a threat to his kingdom, he's going to try to put you out of commission. He will try. It doesn't matter. To school, wherever it may be. If it's a full-time ministry, if it's pastoring, it doesn't matter. Amen? 
Peter knew this. He, I'm getting a little more attention than I need here, you know. And, and the reason was the devil's really worried about Peter here. He's worried about this preacher. Amen. It's essential that I keep this man of God out of circulation, he was thinking. And, and, and you know, the devil just don't like us messing with his stuff. And, and, and he thinks that it's his. Especially preaching to the lost like Peter was doing. I mean, he's got him, the devil's got him in a bound and blinded and you know, completely, uh, you know, in a condition that where they're addicted and completely bound by the chains of sin and the wickedness there. And <clears throat> Peter is preaching to the lost and hell doesn't like what's going on. And hell is trying to keep you and I off the streets. Huh? Amen. Hell is trying to keep us out of the foreign field. He's trying to keep you off the campus. Amen. Me off the campus. He's trying to keep us, you know, from witnessing at work, on the job. He's doing everything he can to put you out of circulation. Amen. And he'll give you, and certainly he will give you a good beating if you'll stop. If it'll make you stop, the devil will do that. He'll do anything he can. And, you know, within, you know, the church, people are, 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 you got traitors up in the church, tares in the church, hypocrites, compromisers in the church, amen, no burden for the lost, even those that are near to them, amen, and they're going to give you trouble from within, not just from without. Overkill? Well, it's kind of a backhanded compliment. Sometimes hell is threatened. Acts chapter 19 says this, yeah, the devils, you know the story, where, where those seven sons of a Seba were trying to cast demons out under their own power. And the demons responded, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? You know, the devil, if you're known in hell, as one man put it, then he's going to say, you know, Jesus I know, and you know, board golf I know, or Herod or Tucker or whoever I know. But who are you? You know, who are you? I know them. I'm, I'm afraid the devil, you know, he, he, he's not afraid of most of the church. Most of the church world is, an, is not a, a, a threat to Satan's kingdom. I'm not giving him glory. I'm just telling the things as they are. Most of the church world is is hip hopping. Most of the church world is uh, down in Disneyland. Most of the church world is down at the ball game. Most of the church world, you know, loves the world. Most of the church world loves the fashions, the styles, and the fads of the world, the music of the world. That's what the church, most of the apostate church world. I'm going to say the the real church world is apostate. The devil. Loves that. And so he can say, you know, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? He knows that Peter is full of the Holy Ghost and, and he's a danger. He's a danger to his kingdom, which is just temporary here on this, in this earth. I mean, two soldiers, two chains, more than one guard at cell door. In the first ward gate, and the second, there's a gate on the first ward. The second ward, there's another inner gate, and then there's an outer gate. You ever wonder why all the hindrances? Why are they trying to keep Paul in or Peter in? Why all the security around this preacher? He's a threat to the kingdom of hell. He's a threat to the devil. That's right. Now, we should never allow hell to dictate whether we fight or not. Amen? Amen? I'm God's property, and the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It won't prevail against the Lord. It's not going to prevail against you if you live righteous, if you live pure, if you live separated and sanctified into this world. That's my question. I don't know you folks, really. I know your face. I know some names. But the question is to all of us, really, are we a threat to the kingdom of heaven? Look, many of the afflictions of the righteous, 
People back up. They want a side door. They want some backup plan, amen, to get out of this somehow. But if we're going to make heaven our home, many of the afflictions of the righteous. The Bible says in Acts 14 and 22 that through much tribulation are you going to enter into the kingdom of God. You're going to have to say no to this world. You're going to have to say no to mom, to dad, unbelievers, if they're unbelievers. A sister, a brother, a family member, an in-law, an outlaw, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to say no. Just say no. Amen. And you're going to have to resist the devil, but you're going to have to submit yourself unto God first, and then you'll be able to resist the devil. You can't give place to the devil, amen, in anything in your life. Listen, the world is alluring, amen? The cosmos, we don't worship and bow down to trees. That's one definition of the world. We've got humanity and the inhabitants of the world. There's another Greek definition of the world. And then we see the pleasures and the material world that, that the devil allures to all of them. And if we're touching any of those three things, amen, in any way, I'm not saying that you can't buy food, put gas in your, that's not it at all. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. Hallelujah. You're not of this world. Amen. If you're touching that and that enamors you and you're more interested in that, and that is a more of a, then you're not ready for the rapture. Woo. You're not prepared to meet Jesus Christ. You've got a spot, you've got a wrinkle, you've got a blemish, you've got something there that's keeping you from fellowship, pride, carnality, amen. These things amen. separate us. We're no match for the devil, but Christ in us is a match, amen. The devil will not prevail against the kingdom of God, nor the gates of hell will not prevail against us. But he is a conquered devil. Amen. But Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Can we live free from sin? Amen. Amen. We absolutely can. Absolutely. By the power and the grace of God. Amen. The ship is sinking fast in this story. Y'all sang about it. Mark 4, 37. And there arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now nautically speaking, nautically, you know, like the, I was in the Coast Guard, you know, there are nautical terms. And nautically speaking, amen, to stay with the ship is an obligation of the captain and not some antiquated custom that the captain stay, but it is necessary that the captain stay on the ship. Like the Titanic and all those other ships that have gone down with the captain. If they survived, if they didn't. The captain is on the ship and there's a storm. Passenger, crew, contents are relying on him. They're relying on you, Pastor. Amen. They're relying on you, Dad. They're relying on you, Mom. Amen. You see, the ship is your home, perhaps. The ship is our country. The leader is our president. But in the church and in spiritual things and the economy of God, the man of God is the most important uh, man at the helm, if you will, out there right now preaching the gospel. The most important person out in this United States of America is a man of God, full of the Holy Ghost, amen, preaching the word of God. Amen. Jesus is our captain. We know that. And he's very concerned about the people that are on this ship, the whole thing. And he's trying to train the disciples on this ship, amen, have faith. Quit ye like men and be strong, is what he's trying to tell them. I've been with you for a while, amen. It's not if, but it's when, amen. We know. You see... There were two houses as I get ready to wind down here. When you look in the Sermon on the Mount, and the storm will come. It, it, 
They're going to come. But this is a faith bill. Your trust is where? Where is your trust? Master careth not that we perish? You know, we sing that song. It's a good song. It's got good words to it. But, you know, it's got to be crystallized in here. It's got to have meaning to me. It's got to have meaning to you. It's got to sink down. You know, Jesus said that about words sinking down into their hearts. They had knowledge of it. But God wants his word to sink down. And that's what he's trying to do here. Amen? And the big period at the end of the Sermon on the Mount was, was about a storm and how they were building. I don't think it's the coincidence that Jesus put a great big period on the Sermon on the Mount with that illustration of where you're building your house, on the rock or on the sand. Are you building it on the sand or on the rock? The storms will hit and it'll find out what is in there. What's, you know, the storm comes and it reveals what's inside. It reveals what's inside. A rotten tree, you know, is going down with a strong wind because it's rotten to the core. Come on now. It reveals a lot of things, amen. It reveals a lot of things about a city, a person. Uh, I mean, you can make that illustration. But some people are just finding a way to stay afloat. They're panicking. Fear is gripping the hearts of many people spiritually because they're looking upon the things that are coming on this earth and they're having a heart attack. Hearts are failing them. And this is the real storm. You know, one man wanted to know what it was like years ago. I remember the story of a man who wanted to get on that, that, that trawler or that fishing boat, whatever. And whenever there's a storm, you come in. You live near the coast. You, that, that man got him, that, that uh, fisherman come out there. He, he said, you, you, uh, there's a storm brewing. Come on, load up, and we'll go out in the middle of it. You said you wanted to experience a storm? Hop on board. He did. Got in, a, in, a, in a good one. I mean, it was a good storm. And, and it was in the helm, you know, and steering that thing, and, and it was blowing, and it was rocking, and you can imagine it, you know, and just squall, rain, wind, just just real bad. And and that artist, you know, he was an artist. Artists were weird, but this was an artist. There was a good illustration here. He wanted to, look, I want you to tie me to the, take me out on the deck, and strap him to the mast. And the captain said, okay. He tied him to the mast. And, and he let him ride the storm right through there. And he went on through. They come on out of it, got into port. And the captain asked him, well, how would you feel? Well, it wasn't the storm. It was all, just all around me. But I felt the storm going through me. I became part of the storm. And that's what happens. Many of the afflictions of the righteous... You're going to feel that storm go right through you. Amen. And these men on the boat knew that. They were fishermen. They'd done all that they could. And they said, we perish. We perish. But many of the afflictions of the righteous. What's God trying to do with all this? What's he doing with Hezekiah? You're going to die. What's he doing with Jeremiah? I'm putting him in a pit. What's he doing with Paul and Silas cutting him in stalks? And Peter, yeah. 16 soldiers around him, a portrait knee, and that's 16. Well, they do with the disciples there that are, that are sinking in a ship. Which one of them are you in? Which one do you feel like you're in? Well, if you don't feel like you're in any of them, you might be pretty soon. Second Kings, we see Hezekiah, the sun went back 10 degrees. And the prophet, Isaiah went back and told him, put those figs on that disease there, you got 15 more years. God turned the thing around. Jeremiah sent a man by the name of Ebed to God did. Ebed Melech, he man got 30 men to pull him out of that stinking mire that he was sinking. Jeremiah put those rags under his armpits and they 
you know, pulled him back out of that pit. They pulled him out. Up and out. Amen. God can pull you out of that mire without tearing the whole thing up. Amen. We tear things up. We mess and go around. We mess it up. Listen, that, that lady was working that old yarn thing. You know, they spin those things in the, in the cotton, you know, that yarn mills and all, old time looking thing, and it got tangled. And the big sign on the, on, the, on the wall said, if the thing gets tangled, hit this button right here called Borman. No, no, well, it didn't no, work. No, she tried it, you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to fix it. People, I'll try it. No. And she got herself in a mess, and, and it got no, real no, bad, and, and no. it got worse. And the foreman, she finally hit the button here from the foreman. The foreman, well, I, I did the best I could, boss. And he pointed it to the sign and said, doing the best you can is to call on me. And mash that button. That's doing the best you can. When you try to mess around and try to get the tackle out and try to get it out over and over again, how many times have we failed? Have we failed in that area? Amen. And so Paul and Silas, amen, are in this situation as well. Amen. What would most people do? Most wouldn't be living in such a way, amen, probably to warrant, uh, you know, these conditions, probably. How many people are willing to be, you know, most churches are very inclusive anymore. You can't be negative. Amen. Don't be talking down on anybody. Don't be preaching against sin. Don't call people to repentance. Amen. You know, you can't be doing that. You're going to run them off. You know, this is a new age we live in. Amen. A bunch of utilitarians, you know. Amen. We just got to have the greatest good for the greatest number. You see, most people whine and complain over the most frivolous things. Come on now. Let me say that again. Most people whine and complain over the most frivolous, non-essential things. It's true. And, and, and if there were 12 spies there, most people would be part of the 10. Paul and Silas would be the Joshua and Caleb there. In this condition, in this New Testament. Amen. They prayed. They sang. Amen. I mean, hey, this is a novel thing. Let's praise God. That's astounding. Let's do something novel. Amen. Let's do what Paul and Silas did. There's stench and there's stink everywhere. It's a midnight hour. And the Bible says in Psalm 35, they believed it. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. Peter got more than those soldiers. I mean, 16 soldiers to watch one man. But the saints were praying. Angels started opening doors. What happened? I'm talking about the Lord delivering them out of all. Delivers you and I. Why are we different than Hezekiah or Jeremiah or Paul and Silas or Peter here or the 12 disciples? Huh? Is there any difference? Men of God, men of faith, men who trusted in the Lord. These angels are opening doors to spare the executioner from killing an innocent man in the morning. And suddenly, what happened? We see that beam of light come. Blind them. Out the gate. Amen. Overkill? Doesn't matter for outnumbered folks. Welcome to Christianity. Welcome to Christianity. Sudden storms may come, maybe no fault of your own. Boat filling with water. The text says it was full of water. Simple childlike faith. Jesus is on board. It's battered. It's beaten. Amen. Not much comfort other than Jesus is on the sinking boat. Amen. Even the best of seafaring men, you can get a bad attitude. You can get a bad spirit. You can rob yourself of the victory. Amen. From the Bible, it exhorts us, search me, O Lord, and try me. I want total victory over this. Each of these men and many others were put to the test. Unfortunately, many people take the big easy. You know what the big easy is? That's what people do when uh, they want 
want to take the path of least resistance. The big easy is uh, the Mardi Gras, New Orleans. They call it the big easy. But in the Bible, there's another big easy. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, it talks about Jeroboam there. He wanted to have, you know, worship right there. You can just build an altar right here. And that's what Jeroboam did. He, he, he set up an altar there. You don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. It's too much. It's too much. It's giving you a big fit. It's giving you too much trouble. You know, this religion's okay with yours, but, you know, we, we can just build an altar right here and, and we can save all the expense and all the laborious inconvenience and time consumption and just build you a calf right here in your own village. And, and, and I know the founding father's history and the tradition, but, but all that's not necessary. I, I have an easier, I have an easier way. I'm offering easy street without all the expense, all the cost, all the hassle. So the people, without hardly a fuss, they respond and they say, okay, let's just accept Jeroboam's offer because most folks like the big easy. They like it easy. And it was a nation's undoing back in that day. Over the years, the big easy has not lost its appeal. The truth is, no strength is gained or won except in the school of conflict. Amen. No strength is gained or won except you're in the school of conflict. Strive to enter in. That has to do with the physical strain as in a wrestler striving on the straight and narrow way to get in. It always involves a struggle. It's difficult. It's hard. It's not easy. And so, Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Many will seek you, but not be able to. Enter in at the straight gate. You see, it's not a wide gate. It has limitations. It doesn't allow you to wander at will. It's not a broad way. Or if you wander a little too far off, you can come back in. No, it's a straight and narrow way. Right here, down the middle of this aisle. As I hush here, Rembrandt was a famous painter. And he painted two pictures of himself. One picture he painted in the days of his youth as a struggling young artist. His features were strong. His features were fine. His features were clean. The young, struggling artist. And the other picture he painted of himself was a picture in his later years after he had attained success. But what happened was Rembrandt's success had brought him ease. And his success had brought him comfort. And that ease and comfort brought him to moral decline. And the candle of his soul had gone out by the choking atmosphere of the Big Easy. It's too much for us to go up to Jerusalem. Hmm. Too much. I'm going to read you this story here of a drunk. Sad story. Easy Street. And so often it ends up on Skid Row. The truth of this has been illustrated in countless number of lives. Into a brilliantly lit saloon years ago, there walked a seedy human derelict. He found himself in a company of young men who were willing enough to comply with his request for a drink. Make us a speech, shouted one of the revelers when the tramp had emptied his glass. 
It is poor liquor that will not loose a man's tongue. To their surprise, this wreck of a drunkard man steadied himself and he began in that saloon to say these words. Gentlemen, I look tonight at you and at myself, and it seems to me that I look upon the picture of my lost manhood. This bloated face was once as young and handsome as yours. This shambling figure once walked as proudly as yours. I was a man in the world of men. I had health, I had friends, I had position. I had a wife that to me at least was as beautiful as an artist's dream. I had a home where love lit the altar and ministered before it. But I put out the holy fire and darkness and desolation reigned in its stead. Tonight, I stand a husband without a wife, a father without a child, a tramp in whom every good impulse is dead. What happened? What happened? It's too much. It's too much for us to go up to Jerusalem. It's too much for me to expend a little <laughs> spiritual blood, spiritual sweat, spiritual tears. I guess I'm on painters now. Artists, artists of the top of town. There was an artist by the name of Holman Hunt, and he had a, a, a painted a picture out of Revelation um, where the sun was going down. In the picture, Jesus was standing at the door in Revelation 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And Jesus was standing there. The sun was about to set. The pot, the plant that was to the side over there had gone to seed. There was no knob on the side of the door that Jesus was standing. Just the doorknob on the other side. And you could see as the shadows were dropping, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You see, it's getting later. The whole idea was it's later than you think. It's later than you think. Amen. He stands at the door and knocks. He said, just for the salvation of souls, certainly for that. Whosoever will open and let me in. Come in. I'll suck with him and he with me. Eternal life. I mean, God offers salvation to a child. I mean, a born-again experience is, is a, a grueling, I mean, hard, I mean, to get through yourself and get through the sin and get to the cross and, and choose to die and not live, it, it's grueling. But there comes a moment when a man passes from death unto life. Amen. And that's what God wants. He delivers us from all of these afflictions. But he stands at the door of God and he's asking a question here tonight. You know, um, Maybe something along this line. Why do we continue to try to do it ourselves? You know, that's a question only each individual can ask. Answer rather for themselves. I'll ask the question. That's what preachers do. Ask questions. But what is it with you? Or you, brother, or sister. Who is it? God throws. His light shines. He speaks his word. The Holy Ghost yields. And, just, and what do we do? Most of the time, he says, I surrender all, but do we really? Are we all in? Or just part of you know, he stands at the door. Oh, he's not going to kick it down. He's not going to force him with something. He wants us to go. That's just, that's just not a backslidden way of seeing church there. He's talking about a church person, perhaps. That believer that is not doing it. I mean, these afflictions are going to come. What was Jesus trying to tell us through all of these examples here tonight? Look, I'll pull you out of the pit. 
and I won't rip you apart. I'll get you out of this storm, and you won't crash. I'll calm this thing. Why don't you just believe and trust and obey? Amen. That's what God wants. That's right. Then he said, you want revival? It's just a new consecration, a renewed commitment to obedience. That's what God said. Are we going to obey? We love the Lord, okay. I'm not questioning that. I'm saying, look, this thing is deeper and higher than what we got. Many of the afflictions, we're going to need more inside. I mean, more of Jesus, if you will. We need more of the Holy. We need an infilling and a double portion, if you will, in this hour that we're facing in, the, in, in this perilous time we live. Amen. So the question is, as you stand here, You can tell I'm rusty. <laughs> the sun was setting that day in Capernaum, but Jesus was doing miracles even at the end of the day, a wearisome day. You read that sometimes. He preached, he did miracles. I mean, the embodiment of exhaustion. That was Jesus, though. He knows your frame is dust. You don't have the wherewithal. That's why we need him. I cried unto the Lord. Why don't we do that tonight? Let's avail ourselves of the time we have here. And let's come into the altar. And let's cry unto the Lord. And he'll hear. He'll hear. If you're serious, he'll hear.